Hi, I have a remote control. I have somewhere between, it, in a little timer, somewhere between 45 and 30 minutes in which to explain the future. I'm gonna have to leave out some of the details. We don't have a lot of time, let's get going. Here's a quick introduction of me, maybe. Okay, let's move on. And let's think about you, let's think about the next 10 years. How many of you are here in 2015? Not all of you. How many plan on still be around in 2025? How many are going to wait and see how the talk goes? OK, so imagine you and yours in 2025. Your work, your play, your friends, your family. All of this. Where's it going? Where do we go from here? Now, I want you to memorize this number. This is the potential new number of internet addresses that comes with IPv6, Internet Protocol version 6, because we're running out of internet addresses. And with all these devices that we're going to attach to the internet, they all need one. Here's a way of understanding this number in practical terms. There would be enough of them to put 40 of them in every, every cubic centimeter on the planet. There's work to be done. How many work on a computer? If you don't, how'd you get in the room? <laughs> get this, research shows if you work on a computer, you touch your computer more than anything else in your life. <laughs> and they don't touch back. Not yet. But they will, <laughs> and when they do, the game is over, okay? Which brings up this. Mitch Ratliff, I don't know who he is, but he's really bright. He says, a computer lets you make more mistakes faster than any invention in human history, with the possible exception of handguns and tequila. <laughs> we can try this out tonight. This image is from 1915, 100 years old, founded on a magazine, an article by Hugo Gernsbeck entitled The Telephot. So back then, they imagined these devices, except they didn't imagine wireless. But think about how we relate to these things. We cradle them. We gaze into them. We stroke them. We talk to them. We listen to them. There's just two words missing to explain it all. My precious. <laughs> And you know, I know the worst thing is you think I'm kidding. <laughs> Our behavior with these things is indistinguishable from either an addiction or worship. How did this happen? How many of you suffer from ADOS? ADOS. Attention, deficit, ooh, shiny. <laughs> Roughly translated today into squirrel. G.K. Chesterton, English writer, died in 1936, said, we are learning to do a great many clever things. The next great task will be to learn not to do them. We are holding the past and even the present in our hands, and if we let it slip, it will fall, and you don't get to pick it up again. What are we doing? The title, Taming Great Expectations, so I'm the downer on the schedule. And I'm the one that's asking you to think. Boom. So what's all your big data worth? Think about all the GPS data. Other than the stuff that's apparently right around this location in Chicago, because our GPSs don't seem to work. Um, what's that data worth? Tr priceless, or, or, or at least trillions. Now, with all those devices that we're building, the smart dust, the RFID type tags, the, connect, the internet of things. It means that everything inside of the roads is going to be connected. So we're talking about all your data. And if you thought the GPS for the roads was priceless, what's the value of all that other stuff that we begin to track? And what's the value of it? Not just the price. This is the bathroom humor section. Toto, the Japanese toilet manufacturer, 
I'm in a diagnostic toilet that pays attention to what you're doing, and while you're doing it, it's taking your weight and blood pressure. How many of you are just freaking out at this point? How many of you are bothered by this? Why? What would this take from you? I mean, besides the obvious, what would this take? What's the issue? Privacy, yeah. And privacy is what you need in order to be an individual. You strip away a person's privacy, they don't, they're no longer a person, they're a thing. Yet, what if a device like this could catch cancer either the day it starts or nine months before it starts as opposed to a day too late? The issue is not the, tech, the, the technology. The issue is us and how we relate to the technology and how do we use them and how do we set the rules for things that don't show up with rules. Someday some politician is going to say, if you like your toilet, you can keep your toilet. And we'll know that's a lie as well. <laughs> so maybe you're retreating. Maybe you're feeling like, OK, enough. The future's overwhelming. And so we try to hide. We try to retreat. Here's an alternative. In Spanish, there's a word called cadencia. And it's in the bull ring. It's where the bull feels safer. And when the bull figures, that guy's trying to kill me, it starts to retreat back towards it came in. And here's a great definition I found of cadencia. A place from which uh, one's strength of character is drawn, a place in which we know exactly who we are, the place from which we speak our deepest beliefs. That seems a noble thing to do regardless. Who are we? Why are we here? What is it to be a human being? We don't necessarily have the answers, but we better start deeply asking those questions. Because maybe all of this is Renaissance. We look back at the Italian Renaissance and are in awe because of the new ways of thinking and learning and creating. But if you were in the Renaissance looking forward, you were scared to death because it was the end of the world as you knew it. Does that sound familiar? Maybe this is what it looks like. Our world right now. How many of you saw the movie uh, The Third Man with Orson Welles? So there's a marvelous little line in there where he goes, in Italy for 30 years under the Borgias they had warfare, terror, murder, and bloodshed, but they produced Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, and the Renaissance. In Switzerland they had brotherly love, they had 500 years of, of democracy and peace, and what did that produce? The cuckoo clock. <laughs> Your creatives what are we going to create? And what's the price we pay for these new things, this new order, this brave new world? And we are the ones who helped bring it forward. What is your responsibility for understanding the implications of those acts of creation? It may be in a different path. But please understand that Renaissance is presented to you as a noun, but it is in fact a verb, an active verb, a passionate verb. And we must engage. Eden Philpott's English writer said, the universe is full of magical things, patiently waiting for our wits to grow sharper. And that is a design manifesto, that line right there. But understand that we have all of those things. It's easy to get discouraged. And it's too easy to be optimistic, which is, a, which is a, a fragile thing. Because when optimism doesn't work out, then it turns to pessimism, rage, anger, shame, and doubt. Hope. Hope's a different thing than all of those. Hope's one of the great theological virtues, hope, faith, love. And hope's great power is that you still have hope when things are hopeless. You fight the hopeless battles and still hope to win. And you have to have that because you will be challenged as we move forward. And you will be very seduced, very vulnerable to pessimism. We have all these connections. What's not yet connected? So read a book called Curious by Ian Leslie. Fascinating, one of the most interesting books I've read in, in recent years. And it's all about what does curiosity do for us? 
And he says, we're learning, we're losing our sense of curiosity because you go online and you Google something and Google answers the question before you're even done asking it. And before the interwebs came along and you had to research something, you had to dig in and you had to dig through and you encountered all sorts of things that had nothing to do with it but quite often would capture your attention. And he talks about that that fills the brain sort of with a web that captures things. And when we don't have that extraneous information that at times may not seem relevant, when you have new information that comes in, it doesn't have as many things to connect with. Wealth comes from connections. And right now, you're at the center point of where the economy is, design and logistics. The way we create things and the way we organize, measure, and distribute things. And because design as a profession is at that center point, you are better prepared to lead into the future than almost any other occupation. And are you prepared to do that? Ian Leslie says, knowledge gives curiosity staying power and questions weaponize curiosity. I love that line. Weaponizes curiosity. How many of you have kids? It says that between two and five, the average child asks 40,000 explanatory questions. And how, yeah, in a day, yeah, you're going, that's all, 40,000? But when it says that like in middle class, family, middle class families, they're encouraged to ask questions because questioning is an act of love between the parent and the child. And so the parent asks questions and the child learns to ask questions. It says that like children's, the, the first expression of questioning is when they point. And he talks about the, 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 the very eloquent question where a kid picked up a kiwi fruit and never seen one and went to his, to his mother and went, eh? Which of course was, what in the world is that? It's a hairy fruit. <laughs> but it says if, if parents don't encourage the question, don't answer, that if they point and they're not responded, he says that very quickly children figure out whether or not you're an idiot. <laughs> you have to answer those questions. What does your work do to curiosity? In thinking about experiential design, does your guidance answer all the questions, leave people with more curiosity or less curiosity? And then the last question is, it's a quotation from Alfred Hitchcock, says, always make the audience suffer as much as possible. And I want to know who the Alfred Hitchcock is within the realm of experiential graphic design. Ian Leslie said, if, 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 if we don't have to struggle to learn things, it doesn't stay with us as much. And are we just spoon feeding people? Or, you know, like, I, I recently had eye surgery, where I had a torn retina and I had to have laser surgery, and my neighbor was taking me back to the doctor, and it, I didn't think it was going well because it was bothering me so much. We walked in the hospital, and she said, well, my doctor was Dr. Reeser. And she said her doctor was Dr. Reeser, but in fact, it was Dr. Risser. She took me to the wrong office, and I almost panicked. I mean, I, I don't tend to panic, but I was just like, I, I didn't know what to do. Unfortunately, the signage guided us. But then I, I, um, I overheard a conversation. There's a, a, a father and daughter here who, uh, the father works in, in, in hospital graphic design, but also with children in children's hospitals. And I thought that's kind of neat because children don't necessarily want explanations when they're going to the hospital. They want calmness and they want assurance. And how do we build all those things in? Steve Jobs says, creativity is just connecting things. A lot of people haven't had very diverse experiences, so they don't have enough dots to connect. How many dots do you have? How many dots do you really have? Have you ever considered making a list of everything you know? And then next to it, make a list of everything you don't know. <laughs> and maybe that don't know stuff might be, as we move into the future, more important than what's, what's already on the list. But what this does here, so we've got these, you know, the, we've got these dots, and that's all those things that, you know, designers tend to think diversely. But this is best practices. This is where we know how to do things. And 
that gets boring. That gets stultifying. One of the things I like about this organization is that you're, you're, you're working in a field in which the boundaries aren't well established. And that's a little intimidating and confusing, but at the same time, it opens up other possibilities. But in an awful lot of occupations, there's just one path. Well, can we bring it back a little bit so that there's more possibilities in all the different occupations? All, uh, Billy Furcloth is an architect out of Philly, and she says, all materials are emerging materials. I think that all occupations, all professions are emerging professions. But it sometimes means you have to fight the battles to get new things in. Wealth comes from connections. And you as designers have to connect things. But what we're really, really good at, all of us today, because we live in a very comfortable world, is if this, then that. First lane, line implications. But it's very, very important to also ask the question, what else happens? Because this monkey wrench, the pirate notion of coming in and smashing your expectations. And that's why, no matter what your plans, your philosophy matters more than your plans. Because your, cl your plans are going to get disrupted. They say in battle, the first casualty is the plan. But you've got to learn to think and respond no matter what. So philosophy becomes incredibly important as our power and our strength grow, as our influence goes far beyond us. So piracy happens. Arr. So there's a book called The Pirate Organization by R. Duran and J.P. Averroes. I don't know how to pronounce that. The word pirate comes from the Greek word meaning to put to the test. It's not about being outlaws. It's about finding out where are the laws right now? What works right now? That's the pirate notion. Um, what's his name? Peter Thiel wrote a book called Zero to One. I, re I recommend that as well. In there, he's one of the PayPal founders, and he said four of the six PayPal founders did what in high school? Any guesses? Made bombs. Now, in most organizations, in most of our civilized world, you do something like that, you are found out, and you are labeled a delinquent, and you are shunted aside, never allowed back in. And yet, they're billionaires right now. I'm not suggesting you go out and play with bombs. I'm suggesting maybe you look at what the boundaries are. Stephen Johnson and where good ideas come from talk about the convenient proximity of ideas, that you're in a room, has four doors, you came in through one, and you have ideas in there, but there are three more doors that connect into other areas, and so that's why you have to think into other boxes. Next to next. Ian Leslie talks about things that are curiously distant. That's the real sense of other boxes, where you leap over boundaries and connect very disparate things, but you can't do that unless you are a curious being about lots of things and not just what's in front of you, not just what is connected to the bottom line, but have farther horizons. Idaho Lieutenant Governor Brad Little said, one of the great things about this country is here, small ideas are as important as big ideas. Yes, please. That is profound. Because every great idea starts as a little one. So you've got to nurture. You've got to protect. Not all of them are going to grow. But from those little seeds sometimes grow great things, great ideas, great nations, great wealth. So how, how piratey are you? So we have this spectrum here I've come up with. There's deprivation. Poor people don't tend to take risks for the long term because it's, it, they don't have a sense of time. I mean, there's been fascinating studies on this. And they think that success comes from luck because their efforts don't work. Surveys recently showed a majority of Americans now think success comes through luck. Good luck with that. Convention, the, the people for whom the world is working, and they simply want now extended. It's safety repeated over and over again. They suffer from affluenza. 
which is where they think they, they deserve what they've got. Invention, students, they seek safety soon because somehow in this absurd society, we have decided to put young people into massive debt in the first decade of adulthood and then expect them to prosper, expect them to take risks. And we've extended adolescence up to some surveys say 30, others say 34. How many of you know people in their 40s who are still very much adolescents? Reinvention, entrepreneurs, they think about future safety. They think they're taking small risks now in order to have future safety. They don't get the concept of failure. They don't understand something doesn't work, but they keep trying. And then piration, you will not find that in a dictionary, but you will find that from a futurist. Piration is a pirate notion. Where they go, safety? What's that? Here, hold my beer and watch this. They keep asking the question, what works right now? Where are you on this scale? You, you, the individual. Where are you on this scale? I would bet that most of you identify either with the convention, the invention, or the reinvention. But are you, are you really? And do you ever fall into the piration? And do you ever feel you don't want to take any risks? That no matter what you do, it doesn't work. We need pirates. With all the debt that we're putting on, what I'm seeing with a lot of young people is sort of a feet on the ground kind of a creativity. And they're not buying into the affluenza as much because they understand how stupid it ultimately is. And so you have like the, the Divi program yesterday where, you know, you, here you present people, look, you need to go and get a really cool car because this is a lifestyle decision. Yeah, it'll put you in a massive debt, but you know, people will be impressed. You go, wait, let me, let me think this through. You want me to put somewhere between 30 to $60,000 by this thing that will live in a mini warehouse for 95% of its existence? Does the word duh mean anything to you? No, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. But futurism has become a competitive sport in that the older generation, the baby boomers, the most over generation ever, um, they're basically trying to tell you this is what the future needs to be and you need to follow us, and you need to, you know, we're setting it all up, and of course we put you in a debt so that you would keep us fully employed. What do you want for the future is a really, really important question for you to ask and to answer. They, they say they're a collaborative generation, but again, it's more treated like a noun than a verb. So there has to be a lot of training that goes into that, and um, heard a, a designer, I can't think of his name right now, but at a conference he said, Here's the thing about young people. They don't, want dream, they don't want dream homes today. They want dream neighborhoods. And so there's this whole notion of that they are a culture that has evolved side by side. You want to build rapport, you show up where they are, you look at the same things, you, you, you create collaboration and trust side by side before you can have it face to face. They need, the task we have is to help them understand it is a bigger connected world. And that means a struggle on our part as well. Um, they tend to be risk adverse because of the debt. We need to help them understand about the implications times three. We look at the first implication, we're very good at that, but what else happens? And right now the culture is obsessed with fairness, of being fair. The historian Will Durant said that freedom and equality are sort of flip sides of the same coin and that they are sworn and everlasting enemies. And when one rises, the other falls. They are in balance. And right now, there is this fear amongst the general population. See, the, the, the fairness reaction is in, against the elites, who just are doing amazingly well. And Peter Thiel talks a lot about this in his book, where it used to be that creative people would go into manufacturing, into making things. And now the best and brightest are going into finance where they're simply shuffling things, but not being creative. Um, you really have to balance freedom and fairness. They are a pair. And the, the thing that really bothers me about a lot of 
design a lot of the modern culture is this obsessiveness with happiness, that you have to be happy. So like when I, when I talk to audience, they'll say, well, how many of you feel you have a right to be happy? And most of the hands go up, to which I have to then say, no, you don't. You don't have a right to be happy. You have a right to pursue it. But if you have a right to happiness, then it means that someone else has to provide it, and they get to define it. Real life. So I asked many of you, if you had children, most of your hands went up. Are you always happy with your kids? No. I mean, who is it? Um, uh, I think it was Irma Bombeck said that every mother at some point could kill her children, and if a jury saw the evidence, they wouldn't convict her. Um, you know, that, that, that they're not always the happiest thing. But ultimately, if we do it right, that life is a balance and sadness is essential. But we're curating the culture. We have gotten so involved in defining what exactly it should be. This is what we've given children. This is the world they see. They don't filter it like we do. They live in a world where nothing can wait, nothing can last, nothing can satisfy. Nothing is hidden. Nothing is forbidden. Nothing is certain. No one can be unhappy. If you were a child today, particularly in a public school, if you, are, if you are unhappy, you are treated as if you have a communicable disease and you are medicated. And that should frighten the hell out of you. No one can be judged. No one can be trusted. Everyone will be connected. Everyone will be famous. Everyone will be followed. Everything is a need. Everything is a choice. Everything is possible. You look at that last line, you go, well, that's all we've always wanted. We've wanted to throw off the shackles of history, to be free, to be more things. And that has been a glorious and good thing. That's what we see when we look at it the first time. We look at it a second time, we see elements of willful self-destruction. And you look at it a third time, implications times three, you see a list about a society that is tired and wants to sleep. So I've got questions and I've got answers. And notice where the, ex the, the punctuation. I'm not sure if they're answers. And questions, lots of questions. Is everything possible? Is everything possible? Is anything forbidden? Do you know there are contact lenses with built-in digital displays? They're prototypes, that's the bad news. The resolution is only like 64 dots. So that's the bad news. The good news is, eventually when they come out to the market, they'll be wireless. <laughs> but we've got more and more things watching us. You know, what do you not get about the device that you carry with you everywhere that is a listening, watching, tracking device. What happens to privacy? They say if you're in London for an hour, you're photographed like 600 times. And in the urban areas, it's similar to that. So there are applications coming up with the de dating devices where you have your phone, like I believe it's called Tinder. Uh, trust me, I'm sort of a conscientious objector in that whole sexual revolution. Um, th that it's a proximity thing. So you put in what you're looking for and someone else has those same parameters and as you wander around, your phone starts to hone in and you can you know, meet people that way for any variety of reasons. And, you know, but can you really filter that? And, you know, you, you have someone coming up and, you know, they've got their phone there and you're like, they're kind of expectantly looking at you and you tell them to get lost. And they look at their phone and go, I can't. We can't get lost anymore. Which is a really interesting thing for a society that is always, the American society has always prided itself on our ability to reinvent ourselves. Well, of course, the internet forgets nothing and you can't do that anymore. Uh, but you add all these things together and how amazingly exposed we are. And then you add in algorithms 
The result is the algorithms, the big data is proving that we are incredibly predictable. That as we think we're individuals, but we are so predictable. Well, here's another word for predictable, boring. And a society that finds itself boring is not going to endure long. How many saw the movie Avatar? How many felt suicidal afterwards? <laughs> so, you know, there's the whole notion of Avatar Depression Syndrome, where you go to this movie and it's amazing, and it's the most beautiful world you've ever seen, and then the movie ends and you walk out and you're with your friends and you look at them and go, that was so amazing, and then you go, this world sucks. <laughs> but how seductive will your technology and your work become? to the point where we don't care about this world. Stuart Brand, a writer, said, we are becoming like gods, so we better get good at it. How's that working for you? So we think about user-centered design. What about the notion of concierge-presented design? You know, we, we talk about the experience economy, which is really an attention economy, but everything is filtered through an attitude and concierges are trained to navigate with that. You come up and you ask a question, and they know about all these resources behind them, and they route you through an experience that holds your attention and leaves you with a good attitude. How many of you ever used a concierge? How many of you ever, if you got a chance, went back and said, hey, thank you, that was great? Yeah, the customer satisfaction in terms of communication with concierges is profound. So maybe next year, don't have a futurist, have a concierge help you understand how to think about a different way of presenting. Question, why does divorce happen? I'm talking about the greater divorce like in our, our, our occupations where there is such a struggle between uh, form and function, art and science, work and dance, you know, because we're obsessed with work. And you ever hear the, the expression that, that um, you know, Fred Astaire's Ginger Rogers, that Ginger was a much better dancer than Fred because she had to do everything back, uh, backwards and in high heels. Well, that to a great extent is the design, the design profession, which in response to the client has to do these things that they're not necessarily, but maybe there's some back and forth there. I was on the board of the American Institute of Architects. They always have two non-architects on their board. And our job was mainly to say, what the hell were you thinking? And several times people came up to me and said, you don't really get what architects do. To which I said, yep, it's a fair cop, I don't. That's not the problem. You don't get what architects do. <laughs> and you don't understand the realm of design and how it impacts. And so there's more and more we are focused on the bottom line and not on the horizon. And we get seduced by, um, by the, the, the bottom line functionality. How many of you know across the street is the Aqua Tower by Jeannie Gang? Yeah. Uh, Jeannie Gang's architect based here. So one year we had the AIA board meeting here, and of course, a bunch of architects would go on an architectural tour, right? So we're going down the river, and about a third of the boat are architects. And this guide is going along, and all of a sudden she points out the aqua, and then she goes, hey, architects. She goes, my little seven-year-old has said she's gonna run away and go live there. She said, that's great design when a little girl would leave her mother for it. <laughs> Can you do that? You know, I was, I was just at the, um, uh, the art museum in Sacramento last week, and I was noticing down at the bottom, they had these little icons for kids. You know, and that's part of the delight. You know, the, 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 when we stop thinking like children, we, we become grown-ups and we get the hardening of the categories. And if you don't have an element of delight, if you cannot put that in there, and the, you know, just the sense of sort of the Easter egg approach of hit, little hidden things, little gems, for discovery, then we've lost. Uh, hands versus keyboards. So Johanny Palazma wrote this marvelous book called The Thinking Hand. And it's all about how the hand knows things, that, that the, the brain is not the total entity of our knowledge, that our body actually knows things. And he has this thing about the use of the computer has broken the sensual, sensual and tactile connection between the imagination and the object of design. Ouch. How do we bring that back? 
how do we emphasize the value of it? And, 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 and in education, there's this, all this emphasis on STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, as if this is somehow going to save us. No, this may condemn us, because science raises questions that science cannot answer. So in response to this, I've come up with something called PPPTHB. It is pronounced <laughs> Philosophy, no, it's poetry, prose, philosophy, theology, history, and biography. That those are the things that we have to explore that put that into context. And again, it has to be this balance. And the question is not, you know, how does divorce happen, but why does divorce happen, but how does marriage happen? How do we bring things together? The wealth comes in connections, and wealth is anything that has value. We need more of that. Your danger, the danger to you is, is algorithms, which is basically a mathematical formula. If what you do can be measured, there's an app for it. And it may not exist now, but there's going to be. And you'd be amazed at how much of what you think is uniquely human into your tasks, where there's going to be an app that will be, for the majority of the population, good enough. It won't be good. It'll be good enough. You've got to figure out what is not automatable, what is not for technology. A uh, marvelous little book called In Praise of Shadows by Junichiro uh, Tanazaki. In there, he says, were it not for shadows, there would be no beauty. In this little essay that was written back in the 1930s, he talks about the sort of the Western notion versus this Asian notion where here we light everything up. We make everything explicit. And there, there is more subtlety. And it would be a marvelous essay for you to read and have a conversation about. Can you think into other boxes? So working a lot with the architectural students, and Joe Lawton, was, he hired me back in 2007 to speak at AIAS's forum, their annual student convention. And I did a survey of, of the architectural students back in 2012 and said, you know, it's a bad market. If you don't become an architect, what else may you do? And I took all their answers, put it into word cloud. So the more the word shows up in the answer, the bigger the word shows up in the cloud. Anything jump out at you there? <laughs> Anything? And see, this even came up in the conversation at the, um, the uh, Young Designers Forum yesterday morning, that we get the fact that the, the boundaries of occupations are artificial. They may be necessary, but they're artificial. And that a great designer understands that sometimes you have to slip around the borders. And you've got to be the pirate in the thinking about what works right now. And where can I take this? And think a little bit outside the boundaries. We need the boundaries. But we also need to know how to leap over them at times. John Barry. One of your founders said, I see no borders for this field. We don't know exactly where it's going, but that's exciting too. Amen to that. All right, so I have some sort of concluding advice that you can apply. You need, you need to do this. You're going to take ownership of the future, right? Okay, some of this you can apply as soon as you walk out the door. Start smoking. <laughs> what do smokers do that other people don't? Take breaks. Yeah, and when you said that, a little bit of tension in your voice, wasn't there? Because while they're taking a break, what are you doing? Working, hey, come here. Work is overrated. Work's good, it's good for the soul, but it's not the only thing good. Smokers take breaks and they talk to strangers. <laughs> because they are the most reviled, reviled minority group out there. So when they see another one, they, they instantly bond. Lil Tolstoy said, all great literature is one of two stories. A man goes on a journey or a stranger comes to town. Who have you not met here? Who in this room, if you look around, there's somebody here you haven't met. If you meet them and you have the right conversation, you're going to change each other's lives forever for the better. In the time remaining, find that person. All right, so if the first one is to start smoking, what's the second one? Start drinking? <laughs> this is a rather unprofessional crowd. No, it's... Oh, I'm sorry, I have another quotation from Chester, and it says, the one thing which gives radiance to everything, it is the idea of something around the corner. 
Start drinking. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe even coffee. Kentucky Fried Research Foundation, there actually is one. Did a study, found the average American worker spends less than 15 minutes having lunch. So, most of you are average American workers. Where do you have lunch? At your desk, with whom? Your computer. <laughs> My precious, I've missed you so much. <laughs> Nasty bagginses. <sighs> when you break bread, you break barriers. Go to lunch. That's the value of these kind of events. All right, last one. Restart playing. Jim Coodle, designer, says, if it's a good idea and it gets you excited, try it. If it bursts into flames, that's going to be exciting too. People say, what is your greatest failure? I always have the same answer. We're working on it right now. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, have an awesome future. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I was really kind of moved by the fact that you know we are standing in the own, own way of in the own path of our innovation, and I'm wondering, uh, can you imagine a future when we don't have to give up our privacy uh, in the name of innovation? Will we not have to give up our privacy? Um, is, that, is there any possible future for that? I'm not sure, but it may have to be. You know, so um, Marshall McLuhan said, first we shape our tools, then our tools shape us, and because these are new tools, we've never imagined these before, so it does take an effort to maybe start to set some boundaries. And you know there are laws, but we don't even know what the laws are yet. Uh, there has to be a balance between, because like with health information, which is going to be, no, the Apple Watches, that's gonna be the huge innovation, what this will do for health and health monitoring. Uh, but right now, you don't really own your own information. So um, how can designers, I guess, help people be more comfortable with this? And is that the right solution, to help people be more comfortable with giving up their privacy in terms of? Well, it means that, that you've got to, as designers, you've got to be gr more connected to that bigger, broader world. You've got to understand the implications times three. If we do this, your work has implications far beyond that first primary implication. You've got to have conversations. You've got to set up conversations within the organization, both with the EG Magazine, but also just with, within here, where we're talking about this. And then also, how many of you have anything to do with experiential design? Pretty much everybody, right? Who's not here? Who's not here that's gonna have a bigger impact on the future of this field than the people sitting here? And have you invited them? The wealth is in connections. Who do you need to connect to? And then you asked us a question that I want to turn back to you. Uh, what do you want for the future? I want, I want to dance. I want, this, I want this give and take. That, that it is all of these things. It's form and function. It's art and science. It's strength and beauty. It is privacy and revelation. But it is, you know, the, the notion of paradox is not something that we are, you know, most of us have never taken philosophy let alone theology. And I don't care if you're a devout agnostic. Um, you know, the question, who are we? Why are we here? Is important to struggle with. And we recognize that we have this, we have this, we've been given this great gift of being born. And you have one chance to go through. And, you know, uh, the poet William Blake said, and throughout eternity, I forgive you, you forgive me. We are we are not completely knowledgeable, so we're gonna make mistakes, but let's try, let's engage, let's question. And that's a big serious thing right now, where um, in this, this age where we don't forget, we also then don't forgive. That's beautiful, thank you so much. Okay, thanks.